Over to you, Caroline. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Um, just to let everybody know for the moment, I can't really hear myself or see myself, so I'll try to use the slides the best I can. Um, and if you have any questions at all, please feel free to ask um, at the end of the talk or, or even after. So as Jamie was saying, uh, hello everyone, my name is Caroline, and that's exactly what I would like to do and what I'm incredibly uh, happy to present today, really, for the first time. Uh, in front of so many of builders and professionals who actually know much, much better than me anything about earth building, which compared to my usual crowd is a million miles away. So I do apologize again for that. Uh, I normally explain a little tiny bit about earth buildings to archaeologists, and I will try to explain a little bit about archaeology and open air museums to earth builders, which is different, uh, but not to worry, in about a week, I need to explain both of building and archaeology to people who have no idea at all. So that's going to be a journey. Um, the first thing <laughs> is to see the slides. So what I'm very, very interested in is the archaeology of earth building. Unfortunately for me, or maybe for you, I won't present heaps of finds or an awful lot of different things. I really focus on the Iron Age, so roughly between 800 BC and 100 BC, so really the early part of the Iron Age. Anyways, about 2.5 thousand years ago. As you might be able to hear, I come from the east of France. Now I live in Britain, I live in Scotland, and there are much, many more sites, different ways of using Earth that now I need to look deeper into. So thank you to uh, Becky Little and Tom Morton for the new and very exciting work about everything of building and mortars. But for the moment, I'm going to focus on finds from France and from Germany. And the first one, this one in VIX, is basically what we as archaeologists or in archaeology can find. Waterland or buildings, the majority of the time, that have burned down at the time. That's really key because as you definitely know. We're then looking at a wattle that's usually hazel or thin branches. It can be many other uh, different varieties of trees. You will have some daub, exactly the same mixes as what we have now. It's usually hay, straw, grasses, fibers. Not that many animal hair, actually. Not in the ones I've been looking at. Aggregates from the usual rivers, the local rivers for the sandy and gravelly additions. Um, and various types of clay. Now, what is interesting to me is that in open air museums, in archaeology, in history in general, when we talk about Wattle and Daub, which we do to every single school kid in the UK, Wattle and Daub is a term that we need to transfer. It's in the curriculum, basically. So we're here for earth building. Even at school, we all hear about it. The problem is, we always imagine it as you scrape some mud off the ground, you throw it on the wattle, and magically it will work and make a beautiful house. So that's why I have worked with for many, many years, up until a few years ago where really it didn't work out at all. And nobody else seemingly seems to question the fact that you have about an inch or a couple of centimeters wide uh, cracks all around the walls and the only solution or excuse to be found was oh well it's probably the work of uh, women in prehistory to repair the houses not that 21st century people didn't know how to make a nice wet and orb leaving that aside we usually find very well made pieces of daub with as you can see on the uh, right hand side different layers weirdly usually three to five different layers exactly like modern plasters. Um, what I personally find is that they have these three to five different layers on top of the daub. It's completely smooth in between, so there are no keying or anything at all. It's a smooth surface on top of a smooth surface, etc., etc. Up to the top where you have a layer of white paint, that's how we can qualify it, white paint, and then you have colorful designs on top of that. 
Um, that's how it could have looked like. We usually find red, yellow, black, white, and quite often, apparently, some pink. So here we go. Warriors of the ancient times loved bonbon pink as well. Um, we have polished finishing coats as well. Quite often, I want to say the majority of the time, for interior design. And on some sites, we seem to find um, very different, well, you can make the difference between indoor and outdoor walls and different kinds of treatments. So you have grittier renders on the outside and very fine, highly polished, decorated and painted, etc. in the inside. That's Venungen in Germany. This is the largest collection of Iron Age wall paintings. What I'm interested in is also showing you that we have some time, uh, like here on the left, different colors on it. Everything is red and a little bit of black. The problem we have and that we have to keep in mind, especially myself, studying and working on recreating uh, mineral paint or paints that were apparently all minerals at the time. If it burned down, it got the walls and the paints to reach a very high temperature. So all these mineral pigments turn red. They usually work with um, ochres or iron oxide. If they are heated up above 250 to 70 degrees, they begin to turn colors and they will all turn red. Sometimes disappear, sometimes turn black, like in pottery. I leave that aside. That's mainly for the study of, of paint and colors in history. Basically, I'm blind now that the walls have burnt. I can't tell if it was a yellow and pink painted wall. It's all red. So I lose quite a lot of information there. That's on the right, the, <laughs> the wall. So on archaeology, we're happy with little tiny pieces. And when you put together all the tiny pieces, you have a better idea with a, a bit of a medium sized piece. So that's what I'm working with for the moment. On the reverse of all these pieces of, um, of burnt daub, we have the imprints of the wattle, sometimes of the beams that were not round wood. They very usually um, square timbers, quite smooth, right angles, nice, effectively quite modern, or maybe more modern than we imagine. This really is, is very recent for me. Again, thank you, Becky. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have, to me, the earliest wall paintings in the UK. Ness of Brogar on the Orkneys. They have been found some years ago, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't know about them until very recently. Now, especially the one on the right. On the left, I'm not too certain, but on the right, we definitely have paint directly on the stone walls of these Neolithics way before the Iron Age, way before what I study. Um, again, on the Orkneys, we find little pieces of hematite, for example, that will give us our red color. Many other things, but I wanted to show that, yes, even in the UK, even if I don't have much, there still are quite a lot of work to be done, still is quite a lot of work to be done on wall paintings that can teach us many different things. And I will get, I do apologize, really excited about these few next slides because it's about tools and what we found again pretty recent the Orkneys are amazing Scarabray and the Nessel Brodgar have brought us so many different things you have little bone cups that are made for the vertebrae of a whale inside the cups there are still traces and powdered pigments my personally, my favorite, um, the little seashell, little, it's, it's an oyster shell, it's pretty big, the palm of your hand, if you like, with Neolithic, so 3,000 year old paint still in it. You have these pieces of hematite, so of iron ore or iron oxides that are sometimes incredibly polished to the point that they look like jewelry, but when you make paint and mineral paint, the trick is you need to break apart grind, rub, there are many different methods, these minerals to get them to a small size particle and then be able to extract, to separate the color, the pigment, from the sand, the quartz, or the things that you might not want in your paint. Again, if it's for walls, like we have just seen, you can grind them 
without any further treatment in pestles and mortars, which is very convenient on the Orkneys because we also found the mortars, tiny mini five centimeter square stone mortars with the paint still in it. So we have a collection of quite a lot of things just on these islands. I was mentioning the oyster shell. This is what I do on the right hand side. When I do demonstrations, uh, display, run courses, I try to use uh, re replica tools. And without knowing about this find, using seashells is a commonly accepted thing in natural art forms and so on and so forth, simply because they are cheap, efficient, very easy to clean. If they get damaged, you just throw them away and find some more. It's exactly what we find in the archaeology and in some monasteries in the medieval ages that people, well, probably monks or nuns, chucked at the back of the garden with still traces of paint inside. Now that will be more for you. I don't want to include myself yet. I'm just on a learning curve about earth building. These are effectively tools that I would like some people's opinion on because I see them in museums and suddenly we don't quite know. And as an archeologist and having worked a lot in museums, I can tell you, never trust something that's written in a museum. Check it. So on the top, you have a clay float. It could be a float, it could be something else. It's very thin under. It's a little, tiny little bit curved. Again, it's Gallo-Roman, so it's after the Iron Age. We, we have Roman construction, we work with lime, we work with frescoes, we have mosaics on the floors. So it could be a tool that's used for something else than plasters. Again, personally, I wouldn't be able to tell. We have some cute little um, I would say spatulas, they are definitely trowels. We have some very sexy trowels, which is something you don't always hear about. Um, again, some from France, some from England, some from Scotland. They pop up absolutely everywhere. There's many on Vindolanda, including with the wooden handle. They never ever changed in shape. You have some huge ones, round, sharp corners. If you went to any any construction shops, any lime and aggregate suppliers now, you would find the exact same tools. Except perhaps that Roman marble pigment grinder. Again, I would double check on this because I thought it was for smoothing floors. It's pretty big, so it would be incredibly heavy not to be used on the walls, but there you go. These are just a few examples. And my most recent discovery. You just have to visit museums. It's incredible. I feel really um, a bit out of it for the moment. Wooden floats. We still use them. That's a Roman wooden float, probably first century AD now um, in Scotland near Hadrian's Wall. Again, no difference, though this one is incredibly thin. So that's a replica that's being made for me for the moment, so I can test it out on some walls later on. On the paintbrush side of things, we just have no evidence. We know they were painting. We can see the brush strokes. I can tell you they have small and big brushes. That's it. That's as far as we go. So the trick for me, what I'm working on, is mainly recreating, making brushes that are natural materials available at the time in the local area. And that's it. That's all I can do from there. For the rest, as a recap, we have quite a lot of archaeology. We have the colors, the texture, the layers. So we should be able, in open air museums, in these sites where we recreate houses or buildings from the past, we should be able to make and to see such a nice interior. That's in the north of France, Samara Archaeological Park. And it's, for the moment, the site I would recommend the most. They have really worked on their plasters. Not them. They have worked with apprentices, teachers and professionals in earth buildings and modern architecture to actually work on their buildings and present something that was, well, according to the archaeology. What we actually see in many, many open air museums, especially the ones I know of, and I don't know many, in the UK, is this. 
And that's where the heart just skips a bit and go, ah, that's the waterland door we often work with. To be fair, it very much is beginning to change now. People begin to, to be more conscious that there is a problem. It's our lack of skills, our lack of training in open air museums and in archaeology that stops us from replicating these very nice plasters and interiors and buildings from the past. We usually work with buildings that are between 20 and 30 years old at the moment. Open air museums are getting on a little bit and we don't have appropriate maintenance or even sometimes repairs of these buildings, again, simply because either we have lost the skills in these 30 years or we just haven't had it. And it has been a case of throwing a mix of clay and a few a bit of fibers and everything onto a wattle and hoping for the best. Though uh, the Ancient Technology Center, for example, which is where I worked for the last three, et cetera, years, that has been done by children. Again, wattle and dope, as I was saying, is something that we teach usually case stage two and three, so very small children. When they learn about prehistory, one of the keywords is wattle and dope, and it's nice to have them handle it, make it and do that themselves. The problem is if you don't have somebody working with them who understands the materials and really push for the finish that we want to be achieved, then you end up with examples of buildings that now every single visitor visiting will consider being what people lived in at the time. On an archaeology side of things, it's wrong and it's not helping at all um, the case of, of building, all simply. You might have heard people tell you, oh, will it be dusty? Is it not a bit dark? Is it not a bit dirty? Really? You're working with mud, etc., etc. That's usually where it comes from. This great big idea that oh, we lived in earth building many hundreds, sometimes thousands of years ago, dirty, poor, backwards kind of environments. To me, having worked all my life in open air museums, that's where changing mind starts. When in a museum, when you see buildings from the past, you can show how nicely made they were and how impressive and homey and very beautiful it can be also in a 21st century environment. These three uh, photos are a perfect example to me of what I want to see in an open air museum. And these are uh, on the top, Samara, so that's in the north of France, but so ancient farm, southern England, and you have um, Avalon archaeology. Anglo-Saxon Hall, which is again south of England, but southwest of England. This is what I would like to be able to do. So hopefully I'll learn more and more and more about earth building and every single other craft, it seems. Um, be it turf, being the wooden structures, the drainage, the thatching. I would like to be able to know enough about all these to then go to open air museums and either help them to connect with people like you all, professionals, or give them at least an overview of what might be lacking, might be missing, and what we could do better. Because, and I hope it's the right slide, otherwise this because will just not work. Oh, it works. <laughs> because, we have a new definition of a museum, and that has happened last year only. Not much noise has been made out of it, but basically, now, museums foster sustainability. And that has been a key addition to the definition of a museum and of an open-air museum. Now, we have to foster diversity, sustainability, sharing with communities, education, enjoyment, effort, and et cetera, et cetera sustainability in so many different places, yet, as far as I know, there are very, very few sites that have considered sustainability in the built environment for their modern buildings. So what we know from the archaeology can be shown, what we begin to have in open air museums as ancient buildings. But what about the cafes? 
the exhibition spaces, even the toilets, the offices, all of these buildings, we could have a very, a very interesting parallel to draw from the archaeology to a very modern 21st century hyper design using interior, using exactly the same materials, sometimes the same tools and techniques, but it would provide the visitors with an example of what they can have in their own houses. And just this understanding that it's not because they are visiting a place that's all about history, archaeology and the past, that that has died. I have not yet seen more than three, maybe two sites that actually are doing this in Europe. Again, I have to visit more of Europe. But these are the few examples. Samara Archaeological Park, again in the north of France. They have taken a first little step, which was thatching the entrance building. So it's really trying to work with the materials that are in that local area around the park, which is quite marshy, really. So we have reed thatch, great. The National Museum in Edinburgh has clay plaster in the archaeology section, but it is considered as an, an art piece. And the artist had been asked to make it cracked, which is very beautiful. But for me, that's really getting the wrong idea. It's the past, it cannot be very well done, and of course it's mud. Yes, but then explain it more, showcase it. It's hidden between, behind and between a lot of cases. But that's a good first step. Grasshood hutting projects um, with uh, Daniel Postmo, Archeobuild, that's mainly a turf, turf, bracken, random straw hut that has been built in Scotland over the last two years, and we are still working on it for the moment. That will be a modern education space. So there will be doors and windows, you know, double glazing, rocket stove, mass heaters, and all these sort of things. But the plan of the structure is from the local archaeology. All the materials come from the very site it's on, especially, well, all of it, but the turf is genuinely extracted on the side of the house. So these can be modern examples that we can develop in open air museums and such heritage sites. Now, personally, what I'm mainly working on is trying to get people to understand that there's so much more to learn, to see, and to know. The major things for um, earth building or natural builders, professionals, I find personally to understand is that we don't know you exist. It's difficult for me to say we and then them, extra, but bear with me there. In archaeology, open air museums, heritage sector, the majority of people do not know, have no idea of building is a thing in the UK, in the world, in the 21st century. So we begin to have archaeological experiments, so experimental archaeology done on some sites about what could we mix with clay to make it work better as a daub? Would it make a difference to have straw or hay, gravel or sand? And the sheer fact that we can uh, with my very limited understanding for the moment of earth building, I can go in and say, well, actually for daub, you know, it's a, it's a question of ratio. It depends on the quality or on the kind of clay you have on site. You need to test it. You need to, um, to try different mixes. Is mind blowing. The fact that we can have a daub that does not crack is a new discovery for the majority of professionals I talk to. So from there, you have absolutely all the knowledge in the world and all the tools at your disposal to go in any museum and say, I can run courses, I can give you a hand and so on and so forth. That's absolutely certain. What I find really worth it for the modern sustainable construction industry is that we already know about earth building. These open air museums are safe for you to run tests that a client might not particularly fancy. You don't have the pressure of time. You don't have the pressure of somebody needing to get back into their living room in three weeks maximum and so on and so forth. For example, um, I'm very keen on testing out chalk floors, chalk and milk floors. Again, milk 
cheese, etc., flows, blood flows, and so on and so forth, are very work very well. But I've never seen them out of an open air museum space because you might not want your house to smell like feet or cheese for two to three weeks. The one past that time, absolutely fine. It polymerizes and turns itself into a natural glue or plastic, and you have incredibly durable floors. But it's not to the taste of everyone. Again, I wrote <laughs> receptive minds, people are eager to learn. They are. The visitors in archaeology especially are incredibly sensitive to anything sustainable, natural, traditional, ancient, these sort of things. The staff and the volunteers will either have come across natural building or earth building and really, really desperately want to learn. So any of these sites run an awful lot of crafts courses. It could very well be earth building courses. Bear with me. Maybe the slide don't work anymore. Maybe that's the last slide. I can't really remember. I'm pretty sure I had one last one to say thank you. Hello. <laughs> so from there, um, in essence, that's what I would like to see more of in the future. It's a connection between open air museums. They don't have to be about archaeology, historical sites, and the natural building professional community. They always are. It, it could be a little bit difficult. It's mainly because of budgets, but they are grants. They are possibilities, and they could be potentially a very good client if that's what you need as well. So I do apologize. There is one last slide that would have been incredibly interesting, I'm sure, that basically was showing that um, top left little grand house, beautifully painted inside, and on the opposite side, a Japanese kushikake uh, waiting bench with a nice daub on bamboo, um, not, not even a blaster, wall. Here we go. And that happened, that was sent to me by somebody who visited a history festival I was at, but talking about earth building with these young people. And he managed to find the contact details of JJ Sharp that's closed for the moment, but um, ordered some pre-mixed daub because he did not have the patience, the time, the will to learn anything about earth building, but desperately wanted to use daub. So he got some pre-mixed one, applied, was very good at it. And now he's very keen on learning a little bit more about earth building. And he finished his own natural building project. A tiny step, hopefully in the right direction. So thank you very, very much. And if ever I find us that last slide, I will I will show it to you. But unlikely for the moment, I'm afraid. So thank you very much. <laughs>